Good evening, everyone. Hello. I'm Michelle Singer. I'm the Adult Programs Coordinator here at the Kellogg Cupboard Library, and I'd like to welcome you to our library tonight. We're very happy to have you. Hello to everyone on live stream. We're happy to have you as well, and thank you to Orca Media for live streaming for us tonight. The library has been partnering with the League of Women Voters for seven, eight? This is the eighth year we've been in partnership with their speaker series. And um, it's a great partnership, and we're happy to continue it. Kate Rader is going to come up from the League of Women Voters and make the official introduction. Thank you, and I would like to welcome you on behalf of the League. It looks like we're still getting used to being out in public together <laughs> again. So. For this program the election, the, on election issues, we present Susan Clark speaking on constructive discourse. Clark is a writer and educator focusing on community sustainability and citizen participation, an award-winning radio commentator and former talk show co-host. Co she has taught community development at the college level for 10 years. <coughs> Excuse me. Clark's small d democratic Activism has earned her broad recognition, including the 2010 Vermont Secretary of State's Enduring Democracy Award. She serves as town moderator of Middlesex, Vermont, and she is a member of the League of Women Voters. Before I relinquish this, the stage, let me invite you to next month's program on January 10th on civics education, where we will hear Secretary of State Sarah Copeland Hansis and from the Agency of Education, Martha Dice. And now I will give it to Sue. All right, thank you. Thanks, Kate. I really like your sweater, by the way. I <laughs> love those little Christmassy things. Thank you so much. So, uh, and thanks to everybody for coming out on this snowy night. Um, can everybody hear me? Is this uh, OK? Yes. All right, great. Thank you. Um, I am. I'm. I'm excited to be here. I know that uh, you know constructive discourse is a is a important topic to all of us, and maybe some of us would rather be at home having eggnog. Um, so good for you for like saying no. Actually, this one's for me. Um, so um, uh, Kate introduced me. I won't uh, go much further. I just did want to say I do work with communities across New England on effective public engagement. Um, and a uh, researcher and writer, um, uh, Slow Democracy tells stories of communities across the United States using local democracy to make a difference. Uh, the, all Those in Favor um, is uh, a book I co-authored with uh, Frank Bryan, who knows an awful lot about Vermont Town Meetings, um, and we sort of called this one the Reader's Digest version of his 30-year uh, study of Vermont Town Meetings. And Freedom and Unity, not technically a book, it's a comic book, okay, but <laughs> it was so much fun to make, uh, and uh, I'll, I'll tell you, it came out last fall, and um, if you're looking for some great therapy sometime, find a cartoonist, speak your truth, and then see what happens two weeks later when they give it back to you in a cartoon. Um, it's, it, was, it was a really satisfying, fun experience um, with the Vermont Humanities Council and the Vermont Secretary of State's Office and the Center for Cartoon Studies, which we have one of in Vermont, uh, in White River Junction. So you can see from all of that that I'm a, a local democracy nerd, so sorry about that. Um, I will be addressing um, this topic of constructive discourse um, primarily from that local democracy perspective. But as we will see, a lot of the issues that we're facing um, at the national political discourse level have parallels in our communities and in our neighborhoods and in our families and in our marriages and in parenting because there's a common problem that runs through all of these. Anybody spotted it? Human beings, right? <laughs> Human beings, deeply flawed. So we're going to see what we can do about that. Um, so I'm going to start by talking about some of the unique challenges we are facing today in terms of constructive democratic discourse. I'll touch a little bit on brain science, how our brains uh, have gotten us here. And then putting this together, what tools, what innovations might we bring to our current situation to sort of navigate uh, and, and create more constructive discourse. So let me just start with um, some of the uh, <clears throat> current strains on our society. Um, I don't need to tell anybody here how exhausted everybody is from the past few years. The pandemic took its toll, of course, on our individuals and families and local economies. Um, at that same time, you will recall that America experienced and, of course, is still experiencing a long overdue racial reckoning. 
Um, and meanwhile, climate change, <laughs> the July flood experience is still very much with us, um, and climatologists are telling us to prepare uh, for disasters as the new normal. Um, so these are real pressures, um, and we're going to need to agree on how to address them. But will our democratic skills be up to that challenge? Uh, and January 6th was just one of many visual aids showing us that we you know, are experiencing one of the most polarized and democratically fragile uh, moments in American history. So if you're worried, which you probably are because you came out tonight, um, you are not alone. Um, there was a recent survey that showed that fewer than one in 10 Americans polled think that political rancor between average Americans will decrease uh, in the next decade, and nearly half think it's going to de de uh, increase. So. Um, even the title of my talk today had to be carefully crafted. The League's initial impulse was to, to have me speak on civil discourse. Ooh, civil discourse. I can tell you right now, deliberative democracy practitioners, the word civility itself has become charged because there are activists working to dismantle racism and they reject that call for civility. They're arguing fundamental changes require confrontation. We don't want civility. We need to call people out in public and we need to disobey unjust laws in order to get uh, elites attention. I've seen whole events blow up and fail just over that one word of civility alone, which just kind of tells you, tells you where we've gotten to. So democratic scholars are uh, refining their language. Um, there's a Harvard professor named Arshan Fong who, who said, deliberative Democrats don't deny the need for conflict or adversarial politics, but think that a central purpose of that conflict is to establish the political conditions for fair and inclusive deliberative democracy. So he says, what do you want politics to look like after the fight? What, what's the model we're looking for? How do, and how do we model that? There's a UNH professor, deliberative scholar, who said our goal now has just been to help people get to the table and stay at the table. <laughs> Please stay. Because this is not sustainable. <laughs> we all know that we're going to have to work together to solve our problems. So how? How do we engage uh, more constructively when there are so many forces that keep us polarized? Um, so um, there is some good news about this, but I'm just going to finish with a little bit more bad news. Um, <laughs> this is a funny slide, but you know, humor is a way to cope with our scary reality. Um, that is not an actual scientific study. But um, public engagement is increasingly inflamed by misinformation. I think we all know that. Social media and um, Amanda Ripley uh, wrote a book called High Conflict, um, which I would really recommend. And she has coined the term conflict entrepreneurs. Think about that. These are partisans and media outlets who make it their business to sow distrust um, because they actually benefit from polarization. And so remember this term, conflict entrepreneurs. I'm going to use it a few times. Amanda Ripley, R-I-P-L-E-Y. Her book is called High Conflict. Yeah, fascinating. She goes all different kinds of conflict from um, uh, wars to divorces, gangs, um, and what they have in common in terms of, again, the human brain. Um, so um, yeah, con conflict entrepreneurs, you might know some. From time to time, you might even be one. Um, so we'll come back to this. Um, so in addition, um, sometimes we are just our own worst enemies. Um, conventional participation, what's called, uh, this is what um, political scientists call things like public hearings. Um, the, public hearings, by the way, the most common uh, way that we bring people together in democracy today, um, have, according to a lot of research, actually made things worse. Social scientists have been collecting data on you know, that sort of two minutes at the microphone thing, uh, that, that conventional participation, which are enshrined in law. They uh, have, 50 years ago, we started doing things uh, via public hearings. And if you can imagine life with no hearings, then you're talking smoke-filled rooms. So it's like, you get it. You get it that, that, that public hearings were intended to make things more transparent. But the way they are formatted, um, Public hearings are, are frequently neither, right? They're usually poor representation of the public, um, and there's very little hearing that's going on. So uh, here are some direct quotes from, uh, this is a textbook on, on public administration. Conventional participation, things like public hearings, um, 
tend to be harmful to, uh, to citizens. It, it, it increases our feelings of powerlessness, decreases our political interest, our, decreases our trust in government. It can also increase polarization. If you think about a public hearing, usually it's like, all right, we have a proposal. Uh, if you want to speak for it, um, stand there. If you want to speak against it, stand there. Very little, um, uh, it, it actually it tends, to, it tends to, to exacerbate the differences rather than thinking about what they have in common. Um, there are a number of other critiques of, of public hearings, but um, this is a, this idea that it can be um, hard, really hard, on the people who are involved. And it's not just, yeah? The, the quote, ignorance is bliss, comes to mind is that if you're not exposed to the public hearing, you don't know. So you're like, I'm ignorant, so everything's happy. But if I do get exposed, might possibly it create these things. So in a strange way, those bad things are a more informed citizen? I don't know. I just offer that as Am well. I a more informed as citizen if I go to a public hearing? Right. Right. Um, I mean, maybe, although I might also be a more inflamed citizen. Um, what, I, what, right. what I'm looking for is a better process than, than right. a public hearing. Sure. Um, uh, so um, and so th th these are for the folks in the, in the audience, but what about the leaders? Um, they don't like it either. Um, it's frustrating, it's discouraging, it can actually even be dangerous to deal with a hostile, uninformed, um, argumentative citizens who are at public meetings. Um, and ultimately, um, we're talking about outcomes. Um, as the relationship deteriorates between the people and the, their public institutions, the legitimacy and the financial uh, sustainability of the governments um, continues to decline. So um, I know that's a lot of bad news. Um, and. Um, <laughs> I think it's no wonder many of us are sick of democracy. So the question is why? Why is it so hard to create systems where we can hear each other? And what is it about humans that makes us, uh, it, it, it makes it so easy for conflict entrepreneurs to manipulate us? Um, so to answer that, I'll, I'll, I'll take a little brief foray uh, into the um, amazing and amazingly frustrating human brain. Um, there, there was a study that was done, uh, first done in 2006, uh, it has been replicated many times since, where researchers wired up some voters to explore exactly what happens inside our brains when we receive new information, especially when we perceive that that information does not fit our world view. So they had a group of uh, self-described Republicans and Democrats who were sub, uh, subjected to unflattering information um, about their own party's candidates. And according to their MRIs, right, this is, these are, this is brain uh, uh, reading, when the subjects were confronted with information that contradicted their biases, their brains actually underprocessed the information. So the prefrontal cortex that's responsible for conscious reasoning, it hardly even fired. <laughs> and instead, it was the emotional circuits of the brain that lit up. So basically, uh, participants' brains used emotion to ignore information that they didn't want to hear but that they couldn't discount intellectually. And what we have to remember is this is physical. This is a physiological uh, reaction. So um, there are scientists like Jonathan Haidt um, who explain it. Um, they tell us that these, this sort of idea of figuring out the us, them, you know, who's on whose side, it's largely innate. Um, who's on my team and who isn't, it, it gave us a, a survival advantage back when we were banding together in tribes for protection. Thank you very much, evolution, right? And, and Haidt explains that many of our individual characteristics, this is, really, this is a really interesting book, by the way, um, uh, including um, whether we're the kind of person that gets excited about change or whether we're the kind of person who like, kind of prefers the status quo, that literally makes us more likely to be liberal or, or conservative. Those aren't simply opinions. We're talking about significantly inherited qualities, and they make up our identities. And we're physiologically wired to, to embody them and defend them. So if we want to live in a world where people can take in new information um, and can find new ways to move forward together, it is easiest if we frame the conversation in ways that don't challenge those identities. And it takes patience. And it takes, frankly, a lot of big-heartedness. Um, Another great book, Catherine Schultz, the author of uh, the book Being Wrong, 
has comically pointed out, in a, in a, she has a great TED talk on this, um, when we encounter somebody we disagree with, we often react on a three-point scale. So you and I are talking, we realize we disagree. My first thought is, oh, this person just needs more information. So I kindly share my facts with you, <laughs> right? But we still disagree. So then I'm going to move on to number two. OK, the idiot assumption, because you have all the information. You know, you're just too stupid to see things my way. So what if that turns out not to be true? What if the person we disagree with has all the information, and they turn out to be pretty smart? Uh-oh, that's really scary. We're going to have to move on to number three, right? Um, this person is evil. They know perfectly well the truth, but they are distorting it on purpose because they are wicked. And you'll notice that this ladder leaves no room for the very most common of human realities, which is that intelligent people of good will sometimes disagree. And in fact, the only solution, uncomfortable as it may be, is to get together and to hear each other out. So this is a really important, and it's especially important now. Um, because at this moment in history, a lot of today's topics Affordable housing, school consolidation, siting wind turbines are, are so complex that even science can't give us one simple right answer because of competing identities and com underlying values. And it sounds so hard. But here's the thing. The world is full of what's called polarities, two crucial, interdependent, but contradictory variables that have to coexist. Navigating polarities, it's not easy. We manage it every day. Any parents in the room here? <laughs> right? Parents have to be firm and flexible. Two competing realities, two good things. And if, you're, if you'd rely too much on one or the other, it, it's, it's, you really need to have both in order to be a good parent. A good boss is both grounded and visionary. Organizations have to embrace both continuity and change. Um, and in our home state of Vermont, right, since 1788, we have somehow functioned under our paradoxical motto. Anybody remember? Freedom and unity. That's right. If we were all completely free, we could never be unified. And if we were all totally unified, we would never be free. Um, it is the ultimate motto of, of paradox. Uh, in New Hampshire, at least, right, they know where they stand. Live free or die. <laughs> but. Um, but, we, but we, we've, we have been operating and understand that these two competing things, two competing goods, um, uh, need, to, need to be considered um, in, in lots and lots of decisions that we make. The trick about, uh, if, if you have a, um, a polarity dynamic, but what if, what if there are multiple poles? What if there are three things? Um, analysts call that uh, a wicked problem. Um, <clears throat> anybody remember seeing signs like this? Um, I, mean, I think pinkies used to have one. <laughs> it reminds me you know, of this. You know, we can do it good, we can do it cheap, and we can do it fast, but you, only get, you can only get, have two. Um, so balancing multiple poles, it's, it's, it's like a magic trick, but planners do this all the time when um, they're looking at a parcel of land and they've got one group that's really interested in uh, environmental issues like wildlife. You've got another group that's very interested in economic development. You've got another that's got social issues like affordable housing it's trying to work on. There's no one single solution that you're just going to pop off the shelf and it's going to please everybody every time. So the trick is rather than thinking about solving wicked problems, we need to think about managing them naming and understanding the underlying competing values, exploring the trade-offs together, and doing that hard work of finding the best balance in each case. Um, there's a professor um, at Colorado State uh, University named uh, Martin Carcassonne who explains that most of the time, most problem-solving models that we have do not work this way. They focus on one of two tools, expertise, or activism. Expertise, we bring in the scientific experts and they will tell us what to do. Or activism, right? Just organize a campaign, one side wins, the other side loses, boom, problem solved, right? Yeah, until, you know, 
the, the losing side comes back. Polarities and wicked problems are inherently different. They don't respond to one single technical solution. They don't respond to advocacy. What they do respond to is trusting face-to-face -face communication. Um, Carcassonne has said that solutions begin when we recognize that with wicked problems, it's the problem that's wicked and not the people. Wonderful best-selling book, The Sum of Us by Heather McGee. She tells the story of desegregation in the American South uh, in the 1950s and 60s, where some towns were so against allowing black people to swim in swimming pools that rather than desegregate, they literally drained the swimming pools. So nobody could swim. So rather than this crazy drained pool politics, zero-sum policies where both sides lose, um, McGee uh, has, uh, she, her book is filled with, with more modern examples of deeper cross-cultural understanding and creates what she calls the solidarity dividend. I love that term. It's like, oh, win-win, there's a dividend. We actually both can benefit when we, when we figure it out together. Um, because the good news is that brain science uh, tells us we can actually use our intellectual capacity better uh, when we don't trigger that fight or flight, us, them response. So we need techniques to frame issues and engage people in less divisive ways so that we can honor our differences um, and integrate uh, the diverse values into the solutions. So, um, so to recap, polarities and wicked problems, they never get solved. That's the, the bad news. The good news is they do get managed, or they can be managed. And in fact, I think some of the greatest human suffering comes from treating what's really a polarity as if it were a problem to solve. It's a polarity to navigate, and if you treat it as a problem to solve, that's where we, that's where we really start to suffer. So how? How do you um, navigate a polarity, exactly? Um, so we could do a months long workshop on this um, uh, if you're, if, if you're interested, uh, it's definitely worth the time, but um, I'm just gonna do a little world, whirlwind tour. Um, and um, this work um, draws on uh, a book by Brian Emerson and Kelly Lewis, um, who are building on Barry Johnson's uh, groundbreaking work, Polarity Management. So what are some typical common polarities that you might uh, see in everyday life? Um, you, uh, I, you know, we mentioned uh, some of the ones that parents see, um, certainly in your relationship with Friends, you're going to see something like structure and flexibility. You're you're taking a trip, planning a trip with a friend, um, and um, one of you really um, it's like, I want to do this on Tuesday. I want to do this on Wednesday. I want to make sure to see the blah blah blah. And somebody else is like, I want to see what happens. Let's just take life as it comes. And you know, like people have gotten divorced for more, uh, <laughs> for less than that. Um, these are some of the uh, ones that organizations have. Some of the ones you see in leadership. Um, uh, things like action and reflection. Uh, you know, are you somebody who's sort of just really wants to answer questions, or are you, a, you know, more of a slow thinker? Um, reality and hope. Mm. That's, that's one that we're all struggling with right now, I think. Many of us have a preference on these polls. Um, you, you might see yourself up there and know exactly which one you are on candor and diplomacy, for instance. Um, it's really natural for, for any individual to have a preference on one of those. Um, and, in, and of course, none of these, if you look at the way these are framed, none of these things is um, bad. For example, um, you'll notice structure and flexibility. It's not like, if I were a person who was really into flexibility, I might say, uh, rigidity and flexibility. <laughs> but it's like, no, we're not doing that. Both, bo uh, on both sides, when, we, when we're talking about a polarity, both sides are good. Um, and it's not one versus the other, we want them both. Um, on the other hand, there is such a thing as taking any of these things too far. Um, so navigating a polarity, this is what's called a polarity map, and we're, this one is on continuity and change. Um, so two sides, if it, and, and this is the kind of thing that um, we can do in our brains, or, or we can actually actively do them on, on paper or in uh, public forums, but the two sides represent the two poles. Over here, continuity. Over here, change. The top represents a healthy use of that pole. If we could just focus on continuity and not worry about it, not worry about change, what good things would we get? What benefits would we, would we have if we could just focus on change 
And then overuses, um, the consequences if we overuse that pole. What happens if we focus only on continuity and neglect or ignore the other, if we take this pole too far? Um, so I'll give you an example in a second, but um, uh, this is, there are lots of different ways you can use a tool like this. Um, uh, I've, I've done it with folks where you actually have four flip charts in the room and you, and you visit each of the flip charts and you fill it out. Um, it can be a, an actual, really a physical experience. You can sense at which pool you feel the most comfortable <laughs> and which, at which one you just kind of tense up. I had a colleague tell me one time that he was working out west um, with um, some farmers and they were talking about a uh, continuity and change issue, I think it was, that had to do with farmland. Um, and everybody was willing to discuss all four of the polls, but there was one farmer who would not walk to that flip chart. He was willing to like, throw out some ideas, but he would not stand next to it. You can see how powerful it can be to experience this with a whole room. Um, but another way to do it is through polling. You can have individually have people fill, fill these out. So um, here's an example um, that some of us may have seen or experienced. You know, should we renovate the old town hall uh, or the school or fill in the blank? Or should we tear it down and build a new one? Continuity and change. So, you can imagine if you were in your community, uh, uh, maybe, you're, maybe you're even on the planning commission or on the select board, and you know that this is a hot one. You know that there's gonna, this is gonna be about more than bricks and mortar. You sense in this case, I mean, not in every case, but maybe in this case, you sense that there's some values involved, maybe some, maybe some old timer newcomer stuff. Um, it could turn into an ugly fight. You'd rather have constructive discourse. So how much you use a polarity tool? Um, I did this with uh, a group this summer, um, and here are some of the responses that we saw, if you think about it. What are the benefits of, of continuity, of, of, of uh, sticking with the old town hall? Um, and by the way, we took money out of the argument, just for the sake of argument, we took money out of it. Let's say, let's say it costs the same, okay. So here are some folks saying it's gonna respect our local history, um, it gives us a sense of place. We understand it, we know how it works. Um, having a historic building is a draw for tourism. Oh, I should have taken out that cheaper thing. I was, uh, anyway, the environmental impact um, doesn't increase our taxes for now. These were some of the things that they, that they were brainstorming. Um, and um, they also um, were pretty, it was pretty easy for people who really liked continuity to um, think about um, what, how mad they would be <laughs> if um, things did move too fast, and you know, what if we did just go ahead and tear down the old town hall? It disrespects long-term residents. That we lose our sense of place, lose our sense of control. Um, so some very negative things down there under, the, uh, under that. Um, but we also filled in the other ones as well. Um, and um, so uh, this idea that you can um, innovate um, that the town will look less run down. We could attract new families. It might be a healthier building. Um, and, uh, you know, start to name some things that we don't, gosh, you know, the people over here seem a little rigid to me. You know, they're the thing, it, these, these words start to sound pretty negative. They're, they're not even innovative. In fact, we're even going to start saying that they're exclusionary um, and that there are equity issues uh, here as well, um, which starts to get, um, starts to get pretty personal. Um, down here, when we start talking about um, some of these negatives, um, it can be um, it, can, it can be it raise some some really hot issues. Um, and if you've ever been in one of these conversations with somebody who really was attached to their pole, and and it was a uh, it was a polarity and not a, a polarity to navigate, not a problem to solve. What tends to happen in these conversations, if you don't pay attention? is that I will tell you all the good things about continuity and the overuses of change, whereas you will tell me all the benefits of change and all the overuses of continuity. And we will have one of these kinds of diagonal conversations where we talk past each other endlessly, yellow, 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 green, 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 green. infinity loop. Um, ever happened to anybody at Thanksgiving, by the way? Like, <laughs> we're talking past each other, um, I'm convinced that I'm right and you're wrong. And this is the way conflict entrepreneurs love to frame issues. My side wants the benefits of yellow um, and um, I will frame the other side purely in terms of its overuses. 
Um, and, uh, so, and, and, and it's really painful to live down here in the overuses. Um, they may be true, um, but if you put me here, it's gonna make me, it's gonna make my brain turn off. I'm going to, if you start telling me that because I uh, am in favor of continuity, I am suddenly somebody who's ex exclusionary and I'm in favor of inequity, that is going to make me extremely grumpy. And down here, if you tell me that if I'm, you know, the benefits have changed, all of a sudden you're gonna tell me that I'm disrespecting long-term residents and I'm an elitist, I'm also gonna be very grumpy. Um, <clears throat> uh, we, it's really painful to live down here, and our brains turn off if we live down there. And rather than being a creative problem solver, if I'm being placed down here, what I'm gonna act more like is an animal in a cage. Um, and furthermore, I'll probably start calling you these things <laughs> over here. So this is called the suffering paradox. If we treat polarities like a problem and try to solve them, um, it has some definite symptoms. You'll, you'll probably recognize some of these. We preference, we attach, we wet ourselves to, to, to one pole. Um, othering, we, we create the other. Um, we, we start to be unable to see a possible compromise. Um, the either or uh, is, is, is so strong that we, that we kind of neglect the idea there could be a both hand. And it results in, in hampered communication, damaged relationships, uh, uh, you know, inferior results, uh, bad outcomes. Um, oh, I have a little visual, just a second. You've all seen these, but it really brings to mind a finger trap. Um, when we start to pull apart from each other because of this, um, we, uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a trap. Right? It's a trap when we pull apart from each other. We, we uh, see the similarity here that um, we have to coexist. We're stuck together, uh, but we're triggered, and we want to pull away, um, and it only tightens the trap. And there are a number of reasons that we might resist coming together, why we might pull apart. Um, we could be scared that we would lose part of our identity. Uh, we might anticipate judgment from other people who are on our side, uh, who have the same preferences. It's challenging our team. Um, uh, and you know, we could be threatening our side's values. Um, but there's some real um, uh, strength, real power, in brainstorming these lists together in an open, honest discussion. When I actually hear uh, you, you know, if we're really open and brainstorming, I could hear you say, well, I, I don't happen to believe this, but I know some people think that this could disrespect long-term residents. That's, that's a pretty powerful thing to, to have me hear you say that. And we start to, it's like just for the sake of facts, we understand there is such a thing as an overuse of my side. I still prefer this side, but yet it can go too far. And a shift can really happen when I hear you say out loud the overuses of your way and the benefits of mine. And it siphons that energy out of the, of the infinity loop. Um, and, and what happens is that the words are the same, but the emphasis, uh, the conversation is transformed. Because all of a sudden, we can come together. I can get my fingers out. Um, and uh, rather than talking against each other, yellow versus green, side versus side, we start to recognize that we are unified in wanting these good things. And we are unified in really wanting to try to figure out how to avoid these bottom things. Um, so it, again, the same facts, but uh, they are, it's a, a more relaxed, uh, not, the, not the infinity loop. Everybody wants the top. Um, and then you can start talking about the third way. What is the third? What is the way that we are going to get something that respects our local history and also might give us a healthier building? What can we do to uh, have a really strong sense of place um, and also innovate and have fresh ideas. If you start framing the question that way, um, you come up with different kinds of answers. Um, so this is a tool that can be used um, in a bunch of different ways. It can just be a lens that you can bring. I actually use it a lot these days, especially when I'm listening to the news. Um, uh, it, but also in a conversation with your neighbors or friends, is this, is this who framed this? <laughs> 
this question. Is this being framed by conflict entrepreneurs? Is somebody just trying to push me into my corner and make my brain turn off? Is there a polarity underneath this that maybe could be framed more productively? Um, so you can ask yourself the question. It's also one that you can use um, uh, if you are actually um, talking with somebody, to a colleague or in the community, somebody frames something as A versus B, you might ask them, what would happen if we stepped back and looked at uh, things a little more holistically? We, we both recognize this tension. We value both of these two good things. How can we honor them both and find a way forward together? What might a solution look like uh, that, would, that would honor both of those sides? Um, or, you know, you can actually use it as a discussion tool, like I said, with the whole deal, with the flip charts and the uh, um, having people actually visit them. But um, watching out for conflict entrepreneurs, they will never, they will never frame a conversation this way. They want us to live down at the bottom with the overuses. So I mentioned that it's, if we want to help people move forward, it's easier if we frame things in a way that doesn't challenge a person's identity. Um, I just want to mention a superpower that I think we have here in Vermont, um, and that is um, the sense of place. In the United States, you know, place isn't simple. Um, in the United States, we have centuries of place-based sins to reckon with. Uh, we've violently displaced Native American populations from our homelands to forcibly, uh, we also forcibly relocated enslaved Africans to our shores, so place is not a simple thing. That said, whether or not by design, the United States is a nation that's full of uh, immigrants, uh, multicultural communities. Uh, we've, we have refugees from across the globe. Whatever each of our personal histories, many, many people feel a strong organic sense of place in the place they now call home. Uh, so it's natural for humans to want to engage with place. And in Vermont, right here, we have some place-based advantages that have helped us to understand each other. Um, one of them, of course, is right outside your door, uh, winter. Um, and you know the days are even still getting shorter for another week um, or two. Um, and uh, it makes winter feel even longer when you uh, just lost your power uh, at a, a heavy, wet snow, <laughs> which most of us did. Um, <clears throat> so when somebody tells me that they've just survived their first Vermont winter, I can share a celebration with them. Or if they tell me that they've been here for a decade, I mean, that's 10 winters, right? S or that they tell me their family's been here for seven generations, or that they are of Native American descent. Any of these statements is embedded with meaning, and it's an opportunity to connect, that we can, we can use it as an opportunity to connect with each other. Um, another one that we have, of course, is our scale in Vermont. Um, our post-colonial settlement patterns uh, in response to the natural landscape, we are clustered in small human scale communities. A, a lot of people don't know this about Vermont, um, but we are technically the most rural state in the United States, according to the most recent census. Uh, and what does that mean? It doesn't mean we have, we're Wyoming with these vast open areas. It means, because it's a census, it's about people, right? It's because we have by far the most pu people who live in communities of 2,500 or less. That's how it's defined as rural in, uh, in the census. So um, nearly 65% of Vermonters live in these small communities. Uh, and what that means, it's how we govern ourselves, it's how we know our neighbors, it's a huge factor uh, that gives us a sense of connection. Um, and that's, a, again, superpower that we can build on. Town meetings, of course, you will, you will hear me uh, talk about this as an inheritance. Uh, there are over three quarters of, of Vermont towns make decisions of some kind uh, at floor meetings. They're little tiny legislatures uh, dedicated to self-governance and direct democracy. Year after year, decade after decade, century after century, it changes our democratic DNA and our expectations of how we make decisions together. Um, and of course, um, shared experience uh, over time builds social capital. Um, it's that place-based trust and neighborliness and reciprocity. Um, they're a powerful inheritance uh, so that you know we can push together. So conflict entrepreneurs will make it their business to nationalize issues. They will name, uh, f name and frame things in ways that will rile up their base. But the more we can resist that nationalization, the more we can think about what we have in common with our neighbors um, is a canny response. Um, to celebrate what we share. And place is our commons. Um, so I'm just going to give um, 
couple of examples. Um, you know, there are a lot of, there's been increased polarization, we know that. Um, but the good news there is that there are a lot of new groups that have emerged to take on um, bridge building. A lot of you have heard of probably Braver Angels, which facilitates conversations across the red-blue divide. Um, I will name just a few more. Uh, some of them are pretty fun. Um, this one, this is um, living room conversations. Um, this was uh, founded by uh, Joan Blades. Um, and uh, you may not have heard of Joan Blades, um, but you have probably heard of another organization that she founded, um, MoveOn.org. Oh, thanks. Denied. Yeah. You've been denied. <laughs> um, so Joan Blades, who co-founded MoveOn.org, um, she has created a process in, um, where you have two people, you and a neighbor, host a conversation on a controversial topic, but the trick is that one host has to be a self-identified liberal and the other one a self-identified conservative. Um, so they invite over a few uh, of their friends, but again, they you know, s have to maintain that balance. Um, and uh, so if you Google uh, living room conversations, um, you'll see that they have a whole host of topics from voting practices to food and health, how to talk about politics um, that are framed in a way that you can have these living room conversations. I mean, you can have them on Zoom as well. Um, and the idea is not to find agreement, uh, uh, shared beliefs or opinions, but alignment, shared intention. Um, uh, so a very, a very cool process worth looking into. Um, here's a new one. Um, I don't know if anybody, any of you has seen this documentary um, called The Abortion Talks. Um, if you want an inspirational example, um, there's an organization called Essential Partners, and it was involved in some very unusual constructive discourse um, and that's covered in this documentary. So in the 1990s, in the aftermath of uh, a shooting uh, at an abortion clinic in Massachusetts, they convened six women, three leaders of pro-choice groups and three leaders of pro-life groups. And these women were so horrified by the shootings at the clinics that they risked their professional lives and their personal safety, frankly, to meet secretly and they said, yes, we will meet once, secretly, as long as it can be completely, you know, just come in. <laughs> they met once with a mediator from Essential Partners. They said, we'll do it again. They met once more. And eventually, regularly, over the course of six years, they kept on meeting, these six women, in mediated conversations. And the purpose wasn't to change each other's minds. That was never going to happen. This is like the head of NARAL and the head of, of uh, so pro-choice and pro-life groups. Um, but they wanted to understand each other better. And ultimately, they changed how they would speak about each other in public. Ultimately, they humanized each other, which dialed back the public rhetoric, which had uh, inflamed their followers. They gained extraordinary mutual respect, and they even started to engage in some cross-partisan efforts. So worth taking a look at, at, um, at these amazing six women um, and, and the conversations that they had. Um, this is a more playful example. Uh, it's just so wacky that it seems to be working. The Warm Cookies of the Revolution. It's a civic health club in Denver. Um, of course, they, they, every, every event they do have milk and cookies, um, and uh, of course it's Denver. They also, you know, they always have the gluten-free cookies and the and the soy milk, you know. But um, the idea uh, is to, um, you know, help people come out of their ideological corners and also to have fun. So they they have some really silly events. Um, this is the civic stitch and pitch panel discussion with moderators on political topics, so things like gentrification and gun safety and legalizing marijuana. But you are required to bring a craft. You have to bring your knitting, um, or if you don't have one, then uh, your craft supplies are, uh, are, su are supplied. Um, it helps people kind of stay human, reduces speechifying. Um, they have a Thursday night uh, football game uh, where during uh, halftime, they uh, have timeouts to discuss social issues that revolve around professional sports. Um, they had an emergency prepar preparedness um, event that um, touched on, um, actually, not just zombies. Um, but um, they did include some, some group activities during that uh, awareness event. Um, and um, clearly, just had a lot of fun. Um, 
For a local example uh, that's, uh, that's similarly fun, um, I hope uh, some of you have heard of the Civic Standard, um, which is a new group um, out of Hardwick. Um, they call themselves a mobile cultural center, so they, do, they, they are in the old newspaper building in Hardwick, but they also will do things at different places, whether they're hosting a harvest celebration at the Grange or free soup nights, or they've got speakers and workshops and music junkets. They did a, a, a homegrown um, theater production about their own community in Hardwick where the town manager played the town manager. Um, and they're just doing very creative, uh, a, a very uh, exceptionally ex uh, uh, just playful and super serious work of reweaving the fabric of their community. And while we're talking local, I'll just give a couple of fun local examples. Um, Peachum uh, has an elaborate partnership between the school and the town, where each grade goes through a democratic process to nominate a name for a town snowplow. Um, and then the voters at town meeting get to vote on it. Um, it's, it's inspiring. It's unforgettable for the kids. Um, and it's this lighthearted moment of public discourse for the adults. Um, you probably also heard about what happened in Woodbury recently, where the town moderator teamed up with the elementary school to moderate a mock town meeting. Um, and the students got to debate several issues, including whether to spend 500 real dollars on new playground equipment or a field trip. And this is little teeny kids up there talking about, you know, you know, should it be, you know, long-term physical infrastructure or experiential education? You know, what's, what are the trade-offs? Public, uh, Vermont Public did a great story on this. Um, and um, in the end, spoiler alert, they did choose the um, field trip. But the Fairbanks Museum uh, executive director heard the radio story and was so honored that they uh, would choose a field trip that he donated the field trip, which meant that they got to get the playground equipment. I'm not sure what the democratic lesson is there, but they have, <laughs> uh, but a fantastic uh, experience for them and for the, for the community. So to wrap up, I will just mention a little dialogue process that's called the Conversation Cafe. Uh, and this is a format, I've got the little cards here. Got them with my yes, along with my my finger trap. Conversation cafe cards. Um, they offer um, ground rules, um, things like um, if, you, if you're going to have a conversation with a friend, uh, open mind, um, having an attitude of curiosity, speaking with sincerity, speaking from your personal experience. Try to keep it brief. Some ground rules like that. And my favorite part is on the back. Um, these are reminders that you can just carry with you, uh, and you're in a conversation that's on the verge of becoming uncivil. Um, there's these questions um, that can uh, help you to uh, bring things back together. Ask your person who is saying things that you disagree with, what happened that led you to this point of view? Ask them for, that st for a story. How does this affect you personally? which is an interesting way of getting past the talking points that they might have heard on the radio. How does this affect you personally? I'm curious, can you say more about that? Boy, we never say that when we're in arguments, do we? And then, of course, the, the, the ultimate. Here is what I heard, is that what you mean? Which is a very, very powerful way to help people make sure that they're saying uh, what they mean. Oftentimes, there will be a follow-up. Yeah, that's what I mean, and. Uh, and, and you can dig a little deeper. So I think the idea with these um, is to, is to uh, take a breath um, and to discover the concerns beneath uh, stances, the interests beneath the positions. Because when we are feeling heard, it helps our minds relax. It helps our minds open. It even might allow us to recognize the gaps in our own knowledge and to become curious to learn more. So the goal is not to embrace, not to validate, not to convince. Um, it's to understand. Um, and in the work of constructive discourse, there, there isn't any more powerful tool uh, than listening. So that's it. That's for me. I'm happy to take questions. And I have more of these cards. Any thoughts on polarities? Uh, Public discourse, snow plows. <laughs> framing. Framing, <laughs> issue framing.
the worst conversation you ever had at Thanksgiving? What, what were you calling the, the people who, who are the entrepreneurs? The Conflict entrepreneurs, yeah. yeah. Or, what, or what about state powerhouses? Say again? State powerhouses. They're not entrepreneurs. They're the state that has, you know, that pulls the public relations strings and is putting the story out this way and mm -hmm. this way and this way. Mm -hmm. and they, Yep, it can be. Things are definitely spun, um, and you know, and that's the world of advocacy. And sometimes, you know, that that is that is a, a thing that advocates do. But it's worth asking: Hmm, is this framed in a way that? I mean, oftentimes it'll be framed in a way that makes my side look good. But is it a, is it framed in a way that is actually making the other side look bad and is actually trying to inflame the narrative? Um, that's a, that's one of the questions that we we can ask. I think in these. In these situations, you, you can ask that question, and it doesn't create more in, inflammation. I'm I'm talking about asking it in my brain. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> when I'm trying to be in this world, I'm trying I'm trying to okay. live as a human being. But I mean, it certainly is a, a question that um, it once an issue has gotten polarized. What, it, once, if you, you know, I'm thinking of like, for example, that town hall example, which is a, a pretty a pretty toned down example, really, compared to a lot of the things that we're fighting about these days. But so that's why it's helpful to use it. But um, uh, once you've already um, had one of, you know, you've already really, really uh, it gotten polarized, and one side has already started name calling, and you know those kinds of things. Um, it's really hard to to do this kind of um, conversation. This is a, a, a much a much more useful um, tool to use upstream. Um, of the of the of the polarization because it again it's like people's brains have already turned off, um, but it's not you know it's not impossible and it is at least helpful especially if you have what you might call a third way um, solution um, to say here's why I'm proposing this solution because I think that the, there are benefits of both of these and there can be overuses and we're trying to avoid these um, so it, it can still be useful. I, I want to be clear that um, some of the issues we're dealing with today, things like um, uh, racism, for example, that's not a polarity. <laughs> it's not a, well, you know, there's upsides. You know. <laughs> but there are f ways that certain issues that we are dealing with um, uh, it c can bring in racism um, and can bring in, I mean, elitism, uh, even in, uh, in the... Uh, uh, the town hall example, um, you can, um, you know, people people can say, oh, those those people. It might not be about race, but it might be about exclusion of another kind. Um, it, they they um, those kinds of key issues can get brought into a polarity. Um, so it's useful to step back when we start talking about some of those issues. I'm thinking, for example, of um, when uh, we uh, want to rename a school mascot. Um, if you looked at a, a school mascot issue from the point of view of continuity and change and were really able to step back, you might see that some of the people who want to stick with that school mascot are doing it for, you know, I mean, you'll hear an old man say, I proposed to my wife underneath that school mascot. It's about change. Yeah, sentimentality about, uh, you know, or, or a connection to place that transcends um, whatever that mascot image is. It's not what it means to, in that person's mind. It doesn't mean the mascot doesn't need to change. It does mean that um, we can understand each other better and not just assume that the person who wants to stick with that mascot is absolutely must be racist because how could they not be if they wanted that? You know, instead be able to step back a little bit and start to say how are some geez, maybe we need to make sure we stick with that color <laughs> you know? um, and uh, honor the history um, and the number of games that were won under that mascot, you know, if that's what it takes. Yeah. Uh, have you heard uh, or are aware of the deep canvassing? Yes, great so what, example. What, uh, well, what it, in a way, it's, it's not quite the same as what you're saying here. I and mean, what... Uh, what is your, how does that fit together? It, it's very, very relevant. Um, so the question is about deep canvassing, which is an innovative tool that um, I believe was in California during, uh, that was uh, during a uh, uh, initiative and referendum process around um, maybe gay marriage, I think it was. And um, 
what they realized was that the organizers realized that they were, um, if they were just going to go at it head on, this issue of you know win lose, um, there should be gay marriage. Um, well, I think they lost. So they started doing something called deep canvassing, which is door knocking but with listening. So rather than ding dong hi, my name's so and so, blah 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 blah. Let me tell you all the reasons that you need to believe what I believe. Instead, it's can you tell me what your views are on this issue? Can you tell, you know, using some of these kinds of questions, um, what's, what's your experience with it? Um, you know, what happened to you that made you feel that way? Um, starting to connect personally with that door to door. It's much more time intensive, um, but um, actually allowed people to understand that here was a human who, um, in the course of conversation, came up that they were a person who wanted to get married and they were gay, and here was their story. And um, it, that, that what, what it's, it's measurably changed minds, measurably um, uh, changed the way the conversation was happening. Um, so it's a very powerful, um, listening is a super powerful social change tool, even though it f might seem when you're, you know, on the face of it, it's like, no, we have to fight. In fact, it can be more powerful, almost it's more sort of an Eastern to, 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 to you know, use the energy coming at you to, to make the change. A video, I guess it's out of Yale, on uh, uh, supposed to be introducing people and suggesting trying. To... I didn't find it all that helpful um, because they had the example they gave, or they gave a couple of examples uh, show someone interviewing, going, knocking on a door and talking to them. And it was like, well, you know, that was a prime candidate. They just. <laughs> seem too quick as, uh, yes, they start by asking a question, but the guy was really pretty ready to, he didn't really believe the position. The low-hanging fruit? Is that, yeah, yeah, it was definitely low-hanging <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I didn't really, I felt that I didn't really learn hmm. that much from this hmm. video. Uh, it would have, uh, a, a little bit more challenging interaction. Mm -hmm. Been helpful. It ended up leaving me with the impression: you start listening until you get a sense of the emotional basis, and then you go in there. Oh. <laughs> mm, okay. Well. So, <laughs> if, it's, uh, if it starts to feel weird and manipulative, then uh, maybe it's not for you. But. Well, that's what I was wondering: whether uh, it didn't seem like this was. What they said, the description they gave, I did, felt didn't quite fit the example they gave. I think, it, I, think I might have even have sent you the link to this. You did. Yeah. Other thoughts, sir? Yeah, I wonder between you and and Michelle, is there any way that all those people that are watching it on uh, live streaming or or watching the recordings later? can respond to some of these ideas to you or, or to the library or? Yeah, up to you, Michelle, but I'm happy if people want to um, send an email with a question. Um, yeah, I can respond to those. We yeah. can show that in sure. all the people we sent the, the original notice to. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'd be happy to. Happy to. Okay. Can't guarantee I'm going to know a lot of answers, but I'd be happy to. <laughs> Take the questions. questions. More likely to know the answers than I will. So. <laughs> sure. Okay. Absolutely. Have you been using this in your uh, town moderating skill set it, to, to some effect? To uh, the navigating polarities. Yeah. Um, it is. It, town meeting is wonderful. Um, town meeting is intended to have 150 or 200 people in a room at a decision making point. Um, so um, it, town meeting is the is the decision making it's moment the end, the end is is the end result exactly. So less um, it's 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 less useful in that sort of Roberts Rules of Order parliamentary procedure moment. Um, and in fact, we are making it oftentimes an either or decision at a town meeting. That said, 
absolutely, it's crucial um, during the year ahead of a town meeting, um, during the time ahead of, um, of a decision that we're making a yes, no decision, to be able to have those rich conversations. Town meeting was never intended to be the only time that we get together during the course of a year. So um, I have been working actually a lot with select boards um, uh, and um, to some degree school boards uh, le leaders as well um, in looking at how this tool can be used in their work, um, you know, in micro situations as well as, as macro ones, so that ultimately when we do come to one of those decisions, it's been informed by these values and, and process like that. So yeah. Very helpful. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thanks. That, my pleasure. I, I just can't tell you how uh, powerful it's been for me to be able to, to um, I just feel like so often it's, uh, in, in public conversations, I feel like there's something wrong here. And when this tool came up for me some years ago, I was just like, oh, this, this, is, this really helps uh, to, to figure out why some of these processes are so frustrating. So, um, uh, it, you know, it, what's interesting too is that it's used a lot in, um, I, I use it in public spaces as we mentioned, but um, I think it's used even more in um, personal coaching um, and, uh, and even in therapy for people to be able to understand the polarities within ourselves. Um, so uh, uh, that, uh, it's, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting tool to think of um, in, in all different kinds of scales. All right, great, thanks. Thank you. If you need a little conversation cafe card, I've got them. I, I would love one. Thank you. <laughs>